Thank you, Brian. Welcome everybody uh, to our evening session. Um, and we are um, Zooming for St. Joseph's Parish in Grand Junction, Colorado. Good to see you people here. Welcome. Well, we, <clears throat> we, are, we have begun the Gospel of Mark. And in our evening session, we did talk about the origins of Mark's Gospel, uh, the issue of who the audience is for, and then we got into the issue of Jesus's messianic calling. Okay, we now continue on and we are now on the gospel of Mark chapter one, verses 21 to 28. This is the infamous great day uh, in the Markan tradition where you have Jesus gonna preach and teach in the synagogue. And then right after that, he goes to the house of Peter and cures Peter's mother-in-law. And then as the sun goes down, the Sabbath is over. And now the entire town is at the door of, of Peter's house, wishing Jesus to do something with regards to those who are ill. So let's get to the text. Mark 1, chapter 20, uh, <clears throat> verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astounded at his preaching and teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, unlike the scribes. Just then, there was a man in the synagogue who had an unclean spirit and cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? We know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing the man and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed and kept asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. Let's go through the text. It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath in Jewish tradition is the bride of God, the bride of Yahweh. It's a time for celebration. It's, it's a time where the people of Israel honored the God that called them into existence by election as, as a chosen people. So the Sabbath was a very beautiful symbol of God's love for creation and most specifically the children of Israel. Well, Jesus goes to Capernaum. It's the Sabbath. He enters the Sabbath, the synagogue, and he goes to the bamba or the platform, probably took up one of the scrolls of the Torah or of the prophets. He probably read it, made a commentary on it, which he was uh, most proper to do. And they are amazed because he speaks with authority like the scribes. Now, what does that mean? Normally in Jewish tradition, when you read sacred scripture, where you were to make a midrash or a commentary. So you try to understand what did the sacred author mean by the words contained within the Torahic scroll or the writings themselves, or the writings from the prophets, or even the writings from the wisdom tradition, or the or what we call the sapiential writings. And it was customary that any male at a certain age could come up, read an excerpt from whatever scroll was handed to them, and then uh, have a commentary. And normally when you read the scroll, you would stand and then you were seated to make a commentary. So, uh, again, in the Hebrew mind, the Torah teacher sat on the chair of Moses. So most Torah teachers sat when they gave a commentary, okay? And so we have Jesus preaching and teaching. 
making a commentary, most likely, he notices a man with an unclean spirit. Now, what does that mean, with an unclean spirit? It means that in the Hebrew mind, uh, the evil one, or demons, or spirits, roam throughout the abyss, roam throughout creation. And many times in the Jewish tradition, they would occupy certain places, such as the desert, uh, the toilet, rooftops, abandoned building, uh, buildings, and, uh, and uh, graveyards. So what made a spirit unclean is where the spirit resides. So in kosher law, of kosher, means what you can taste, touch, and handle, and what you cannot taste, touch, and handle. And so uh, cemeteries that had dead bodies rotting, the toiletry, or the toilet, the lavatory, uh, rooftops, because birds fly by, and etc. they were seen as unclean. So in the Hebrew mind, in the Jewish tradition, that which you consumed from the outside could in fact defile you. What, so kosher dealt, which I'm gonna talk about later in Mark's gospel, the issue of kosher defilement. Uh, the issue is the outside world in and of itself is that you're clean or unclean, pure or defilement, okay? This gentleman has an unclean spirit. Now, there's no mention how he got it, where it came from, but he has an unclean spirit. It's the Sabbath, and Jesus is preaching and teaching. And here we get into the issue of what, of, of, of what most scholars call the messianic Markin secret. The messianic Markin secret is the notion uh, that Jesus wants to reveal his messianic title, role, and mission at the appropriate time. And, and he decides when he's going to manifest his messianic role as the Goel, as the vindicator, the redeemer, uh, deliverer for Israel, most especially from the clutches of the Roman Imperium. So, but that identity as being the messianic fulfillment now in your midst, in the person in the live through experience and in the human identity and later divine identity of Jesus coming from Nazareth. Jesus wants to make it very clear. He is the Messiah, but he will indicate, he will announce, he will proclaim who and what he is. Now it is true in the first part of Mark's gospel, the father, God, when Jesus is baptized, comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and the both called the, 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 the voice of God, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So he always has a divine um, assignation. He already has the divine credential coming from God himself. This is my beloved son and I'm pleased with him. Okay, now that son is also gonna be understood as the messianic fulfillment. So that's why it's kept secret until in the Markan tradition till Jesus announces who and what he is. And that will be at Caesarea Philippi, which comes much later. But now this unclean spirit who has possessed this individual knows who he is. Why? Because in the Markan temptation in the desert where Jesus faces Satan, Satan didn't know who he was. And in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, but most especially in Luke and in Matthew, there is the whole testing issue that is omitted in Mark and Gospel. Mark simply says he goes out, he is tempted, and angels minister for him. But in Matthew and Luke, it is a well played out three major testing issues that the this Jesus, who Satan doesn't quite know who he is, but at the end of the testing, knows exactly who he is and he's out to make sure that people know who Jesus is ready before the allotted time and 
And so Jesus says, no, 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 no. You are not going to reveal who I am. So the man blurts out. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Notice Jesus is placed in human history. Nazareth is a real historical time, a town in the region of Galilee. And look at the next slide, which I find fascinating. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. That is a great line. The evil one, the impure spirit or the demonic spirit is shaking in his boots. He knows who Jesus is. And he says, have you come to destroy us? Great line. There's a kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, which we'll talk about later. This demon, this impure demon, this defiling demon knows who Jesus is and he wants to blurt out Jesus's identity and Jesus immediately silences him messianic secret if he is articulating who Jesus is before the allotted time messiah messiah means one who has been known the king of Israel Israel already has a king and it's Herod and if he finds out is this Jesus of Nazareth a usurper to my, my throne and the legitimacy of my power and authority? I can have him executed. And so there's this issue. If, if it's too soon, then he won't be able to preach and teach before the appointed time. And that's the issue. But the demon says, have you come to destroy us? Great line. Why? Has anyone ever destroyed non-corporeal existence? Because that's what a demon is. He is a fallen angel. There is no body. He's pure intelligence, created intelligences. Those are what, that's what angels are, created intelligences, without form, without body, non-corporeal existence, real existence, without any materiality whatsoever. Has anyone been able to destroy non-material, non-corporeal existence? The answer is no. The demon is frightened. Have you come to destroy my kingdom? Have you come to destroy us? The presumption is this Jesus of Nazareth can do both. Destroy the demon and his kingdom. And he's very much afraid. Because I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. That's another term which means Son of God. Okay. What does Jesus do? He rebukes him immediately. Be silent, come out of him. He, Jesus has jurisdiction. Jesus has the legitimate authority coming from the Father. And he has the power to cast them out. And that's exactly what he does. Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him. You know, he's angry because he's now going to be forced into the abyss. And crying out with a loud voice came out of him. Okay, what's the reaction of the people in the synagogue? They were all amazed. Now notice what they are... <laughs> What they are amazed about, not that Jesus has cast out, the, cast out the demon, they are amazed at Jesus teaching without, with uh, assuming his own authority. When rabbis taught ex cathedra sitting on the chair of Moses, they would always quote other rabbis, okay? They would always quote other rabbis to give legitimacy and approbation to their teaching. Jesus doesn't do that. He quotes no one. Have you ever noticed when you read, when you read the uh, gospel narratives, does Jesus ever quote a rabbi? The answer is no. Does he quote any other authority? The answer is no. He's the authority. He quotes no one. He will quote the Torah, of course, because that's the word of God. 
but Jesus is that word of God made flesh. Okay. So the law that God gave Moses on Sinai, namely the Torah, we believe there's only one word of God. So the word of God that Abraham heard in Genesis 17, stand up, rise before me, I am El Shaddai, I am God Almighty, walk, be, walk before me and be present and be perfect like me. That's the call of Abraham. That's the call that, that calls everyone. Jew, Gentile, Christian, Muslim. It all starts right at Genesis chapter 17. The, the, uh, the manifest call and election of Abraham and the children of Israel as God's elect. So the word, the voice that Abraham heard, there's only one voice of God. Okay. And that voice Moses heard in Exodus chapter 3 with the burning bush. You know, Moses, Moses, come forward. And God reveals who he is. I am who I am. Hey, asher, hey, in the Hebrew. I am self-existence. I will be for you whatever tomorrow demand. These are trans, transliteration of the, of the divine name, Yahweh. I am who I am. And then in Exodus, as well as Deuteronomy, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, they hear the voice of God. And the Torah is given, articulated through human speech. But the Torah is given by the voice of God. Well, we believe Jesus is that voice of God in human form. It's called the incarnation. So the word that Abraham heard the words that Moses heard, the word that the prophets heard in, in the visions that they had to articulate faithfully God's word, that word, is in, that word is the logos. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Logos means wisdom, word, law, mind of God. That's who Jesus is. That's why Jesus speaks with absolute authority. He is the enfleshment of the Torah. See, that's crucial to your understanding. That is his authority. He, he needs to quote no one because he is the word that he preaches. What he is, is the word that he preaches in human form, the incarnation. And they are amazed <clears throat> that Jesus doesn't quote anybody. He has that identity coming from the father. You are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. You know, listen to him. So at this juncture, what is this? This is a new teaching with authority. The scribes never had this, but this man speaks with authority. He even commands unclean spirits and they obey him. What type of power does this man have? to cast out the evil one. At once his fame began to spread throughout the entire surrounding region of Galilee. So that is the Sabbath morning, okay, okay. Sabbath, so the synagogal service is over, okay. He now moves to the house of Peter, which would have been his Galilean headquarters. And we read in Mark chapter one, verse 29 to 31, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, the, the soon to be pillars of the church, Peter, James and John, okay? Now, Simon's mother-in-law was, was ill in bed with a fever and they told him about her at once. What does he do? So they told, uh, she's ill, fever. She is really sick. He came, took her by the hand. Again, the incarnation, the activity of God touching another human person. So he, he could have simply said, arise, but no, he takes her by the hand and lifted her up. 
then the then you know instantaneously then the fever left her and she began to wait on tables she began to serve them instantaneous cure normally in mark's gospel if you're going to have a cure by jesus there's some profession of faith if there's no faith there's no cure if, if there is no faith, there is no sign. There, there is no miracle. So that's one thing about miracles in Mark's gospel. Normally, there is a proclamation of faith in the uh, person of Jesus. This is one of those rare situations where there's no proclamation of faith. It's just absolutely gratuitous. It is an act of mercy. It's the hand of God through the hand of Jesus, touching another person's body, touching them, the touch of God, instantaneous cure. She is so cured that in fact, she starts to serve. So these are the two images. So the two images, okay. Synagogue, preaching, teaching with authority, unclean spirit, has possessed this individual. The unclean spirit wants to identify who Jesus is. Jesus silenced him immediately. So the role of the unclean uh, spirit is diminished and he's cast out. And the people are amazed, not so much by the casting out, but by the fact that Jesus speaks with absolute authority. We are, we are now at that point, we go into the house of Peter with James and John and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law is ill. There is a healing. So the first sense, demonic activity, it is expelled. That which is supernatural or non-corporeal, angelic, demonic is expelled. Jesus has a power and authority over that which is non-corporeal existence. Now, he now has authority over corporeal existence when people are ill. So there's uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law uh, and he cures her. So he casts out the supernatural, but he heals the natural. He heals the corporeal, okay? Now, there is what we call a mark in conflict, a mark in conflation, where you have two separate episodes that are tied into one. So now it's the end of the Sabbath. This is Mark chapter 132 to 34. And that evening at sundown, that means when the sun goes down, the Sabbath is over. That means you can move about. There are certain uh, Sabbath laws that you can walk so many feet on a normal uh, Sabbath day, you, you simply just couldn't go wandering. So there, there was so, so many uh, uh, feet or, or, or uh, uh, length of a, of a walk that you could take. Okay, now the Sabbath is over, so people are free to walk around. And what do they do? Mark conflates the demonic, which is supernatural, and the natural. That evening at sundown, Sabbath being and over, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. That is the conflation. Human sickness and supernatural existence. They are now combined. Jesus has power over the non-corporeal, he has power over the naturally corporeal. He has power over sickness, disease. He has power over Satan. Okay. And the whole city was gathered around the door. This is the great day. He's curing everybody. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. So, so it's a recapitulation of what happened earlier. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. 
So it's so it's a uh, what we call somatic redundancy. If it's said once, let's just say it again. So demons, human beings, demons, sickness, and you are to say nothing about who and what I am. Okay, that's a again. That's what we call a market conflation. Okay. That is the end of the great day. Jesus cures the multitudes and he casts out evil. Nothing's greater than that. He brings a sense of wholeness to those who are horribly uh, sick. So it's a recreation of creation. He's bringing health to those who are unhealthy and to those that are fundamentally, by their intrinsic nature, evil, he casts them away. He has power to do that. So now, it's the following morning. This is Mark chapter 135 to 38. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions found him and when they found him, they said, everyone is searching for you. And he answered, let us now go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. Ready? For that is why I came out to do. In Luke, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. He was sent to preach and teach the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus says, let's go. It's, it's, it's time to move. It's time to move and we got to move now. They were amazed at what he did. The multitudes. The fact that Mark says the whole city was by the door of uh, Simon Peter's house. Think of the people that were sick and dying or whatever or those possessed by the evil one, they're all being cured. Recreation, he's transforming a broken world. He's bringing health and happiness and he's casting out the evil one. That's really important to your understanding. And God wishes to recreate that what that which he created but that which he created was under our influence and since we fell in the jewish mind anything that's under our jurisdiction also fell with us when adam and eve sinned so now god the father has sent his his very word his very mind his very thought his very law his very personality in human form to recreate a fallen world, to make things better, to bring about God's kingdom. So how God acts is what he is, how God's present is how he acts. And, and how does he act? How is he being present? He's restoring, it's restorative. The activity of God is to bring about a new creation. Restoration, wholeness, health, and the cutting out of evil in our, in our human existence. Okay, we now turn to one of the major issues that will in fact um, uh, really change uh, Jesus' mission to Israel. We have the healing of the leper. He's in the midst of healing. And we now have the issue of, well, word's gotten out. 
that this wonder worker, this Galilee, this Galilean rabbi has the power to heal and to cast out the evil one. The healing of the leper. This is Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 45. A leper came to him, begging him, kneeling, and said to him, so, he, so this leper, again, uh, if you had lepers, you were part of the living dead. You were alienated from the liturgical community of Israel. You were an outsider. That was the end of you. You, 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 you could not live at habitational sites. You, you were the walking dead. Here's a leper. He knows about Jesus. He comes to him, begs him, and kneels. So he does his homage. He has nothing to lose. Okay. A leper came to him, begging him, and kneeling. And he said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. I know about you, Jesus. You have the power to cure. I'm a leper. I'm isolated from my own people. I can't live at home. I can't live in, in, in my neighborhood village. I am prohibited under Mosaic law. The Torah. Leviticus says I have to be separated. I want to go back home. I want to live with my family. I want to go to temple. I want to go to synagogue. But I can't because I'm a leper. And I've heard about you. And you can make me clean. What does Jesus say? Moved with compassion and pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him like he touched Simon Peter's mother-in-law. He didn't have to do that, folks. He could simply, by the mere act of his word, have instantaneous cure. But he doesn't. He gets involved in the human condition. He touches the leper. Moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I, I do choose. Be made clean. He speaks with authority. Immediately. The leprosy left him and he was made clean. Jesus could have simply said, you're cured of your leprosy. He doesn't do that. He touches the man. And what does that mean? Jesus is now leprous. For the sake of curing, he becomes leprous himself. That's why he sternly tells the former person that's now uh, leprous free, after, sterling, after sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, <clears throat> saying to him, say, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So Jesus says, I want you to go back, not that you've been cleaned, but you have to have the social stigma of being leprous cast out from you. So you have to go through the, the process of going to the priest who will look at you, examine you, and then declare that you are that you are no longer leprous, so you can rejoin your family, your friends, your local community. So if someone was leprous or touched something that was impure, you had to be certified to be clean so that you can rejoin your own local community. So Jesus says, do what the law requires. You, you go back, you find the Kohen or the priest, and he will write you a certificate that permits you to go back home and will declare you clean and no longer defiled. But what does the man do? He's overjoyed. He's overjoyed. I've been made clean. In verse 45, he says, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word that Jesus could no longer go openly from town to town, but stayed out in the country 
and people came to him from every quarter. The fact that word got out, how were you making Jesus touch me? Oh my, that means Jesus is now leprous. Now he cannot go into, into villages any longer until he is made clean. Very interesting. Jesus takes on the attributes, the reality of someone who is unclean. He didn't have to do that. He could have cured him by the mere act of his word. See, this is how our God is. Our God gets involved in the nitty gritty reality of human existence. He didn't have to touch him, but he did. And in doing so, Jesus becomes leprous. The man tells everyone, Jesus touched me and I'm cured. Then Jesus can't go inside villages any longer. But that doesn't stop the people from coming out to him. They are so in tune with the fact this man was cured by this Jesus. Now, even though we won't allow him to go into our villages, because word got out that he touched someone who was leprous, that does not prevent the, the uh, various people to say, well, uh, 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 I don't care. We'll go out to meet him. He may, he may be unable to come to see us, but we will see him. And they came to him from every quarter. There's something about this Jesus. There's something about this Jesus that's so profound, so clear, so evident that this man was the walking dead. And he had the faith. See, this is the faith proclamation. If you can, Jesus, you can make me clean. I know you can make me clean. So you put me, so you so you're putting your trust in me? Yeah. I know about you. You can make me clean. And and I want you to make me clean. Jesus says, You are. I will make you clean. Be clean. Instantaneous cure. See, this is a God that <laughs> that gets involved in human affairs. This is a God that's not just a, you know, spring day God. This is a God that's in the dead of winter when there's massive suffering and he's there. This is like being raised from the dead. Think of it. As a leper, I would be alienated from my family, from my community, from my village. I couldn't worship with everybody else. I lived in deserted places, people would leave food for me. I would probably have to live with other lepers. And that was a common reality. Even enemies like Jews and Samaritans who hated each other. But if you had leprosy, there, there was a commonality factor that even though we don't like each other, we have to live with each other because we're all leprous. So even enemies had to live with each other if you had the curse of being leprous. So here's a man that is healed. This is a God that pays attention. This is a God that says, if you ask me, I will do it for you. But there's a presupposition of disposition and faith. That's why those four that's why those five points, this is the gospel, Jesus, what? Preaches the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay. You have to repent. You have to believe in order for God to act. Okay. So this man obviously heard and he says, Jesus, I don't know who you are. One thing I do know, you cure people. I heard about Capernaum. I heard about the Sabbath day, that great day. You cured the multitudes. You cast out demons. Look at me, Jesus. I'm foul and festering. I'm a leper. I want to go back home. I want to go back to my family. 
and you could do something about it. Have pity upon me, please. Yes. Be clean. Now Jesus sternly, now he will warn them sternly, be very careful. You don't say this to him. Just go back to the Kohen or the priest and do what Moses prescribed, but be very careful how you articulate this. Well, the man's overjoyed. He tells everyone. Therefore, Jesus couldn't go into the villages any longer. But his fame is so renowned. His activity is so clear, so explicit. He's redeeming a corrupt and fallen world. He's restoring new life to creation. He's making broken people whole again. To be horribly disfigured by this disease. And now you are made clean. Jesus takes away the sin of disfigurement. Sin disfigures. Grace and faith heals. So that's why this is that great moment you know, in the life of Jesus, because he wants to restore. He wants to bring you to the fullness of life and not just to have life, but have life in great abundance. So he knows our ills. He knows what we need. He knows how fragile we are. And he says, I'm here to restore. The only thing I ask is that you repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of God, that God exists and that he brings about his presence by his actions and how he acts is how he's present. So Jesus is the kingdom of God in human form. With that, I now open up the, uh, the class for any question and answer. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Father. Uh, yes, we will now be doing the Q&A portion. So if you have a question, please raise your hand or just type it in the chat. For those of you without your camera, do you have a question? If, if not, just type yes or no in the chat box, please. So it doesn't seem like there's any questions. Does anyone have a comment for Father Dude? Just again, just raise your hand if you go ahead, uh, Elaine and Lance. Uh, just please unmute your microphone. Okay. It's just an excellent. Okay, Lance, what do you wish? What do you wish to say? It was just an excellent story or a great storyteller there. Um, <laughs> I, I love listening to you speak to that. Um, I guess I wasn't aware, um, having read Mark before, I wasn't aware of, of the implications that are made by um, his, his uh, ability to be uh, God in man in those statements. I mean, you've said in previous in previous lectures that you talked about how how um, the Son of God mm -hmm. is one thing and the Son of Man is another. And I was that thinking correct. that. And I was thinking that this is a this is a, a another conversation about he is the Son of God in particular. That's, that is correct. He, he has, has the God. authority of God Himself in human form that yeah, is correct he was divine in this he was divine in this respect and that i read it the first time as a story it's just um it's just jesus well not just but that jesus uh, healed and i didn't understand the implication of touching and that he was actually become a leper i thought oh that's why he couldn't go into town that's right yeah not that somebody yeah. spoken about being a demon or being possessed, it was that now he's a leper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Capable of being, you know, mm -hmm. with leprosy. Yeah. That was very interesting. I didn't realize that until I heard you say that. So, yeah. So, well, um, so you know, that's why he takes on our sins. 
he uh, takes on anything that alienates us from God, he, he, he has the power to destroy it. He has the power to make us clean. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you for your question of uh, comment, uh, Elaine and Lance. And yes, Father, we have a question from our comment box. I'll read it to you right now. Please. Says, Father, I hadn't heard the comment that Jesus was himself leprous. Do you mean this literally? If so, why did the people not give him a wide berth? And how yeah. did he get cleans by the time he returned to Capernaum after some days? Yeah, you see, this is interesting. Yeah, uh, um, obviously that the leper now cleansed uh, articulates very clearly how he was cured. And yeah, and so he takes on that leprosy. Uh, so, he, so he takes on that which is part of the human condition, which alienates us from each other and from God. Jesus takes it on and in doing so, it, uh, in a sense, alienates uh, people that would have been coming to him if he didn't touch the man. And my point is that he didn't have to touch the man, but he did to enter deeply into the fallen condition of human nature. Now, the fact that Jesus, and we can only surmise this, that he didn't look leprous. You see, uh, the man who had leprosy looked leprous, but he no longer looks leprous. Jesus takes it on, but the fact that he touched him means that, that for all practical purposes, by kosher law, he is now leprous. So for example, if you walked into a, a home that a man had leprosy, if you touched the bowl or touch uh, the uh, cushion where he sat, by, by, uh, by touching that cushion or touching that cup or touching that piece of pottery, uh, you became leprous. Now that doesn't mean that you broke out in leprosy, it simply means that you've had contact with something that was leprous, so therefore you are ritualistically contaminated and you are in the state of defilement. So Jesus probably had no imagery, uh, had no uh, leprous manifestation on his person. But the fact is that he touched it, that he touched a man that had leprosy, then by that action, he was uh, virtually contaminated. Now, is there any indication that he had to uh, purify himself by taking some sort of a mikvah or a bath that would um, make himself clean? There's no indication that he went to, to, to a priest to be uh, certified as now being clean. There's no indication whatsoever. And, and, and I think the reason is he has the authority. He didn't need to do that. However, in the Hebrew mind, he touched the man that is leprous or was leprous. He's now contaminated. So we can't have him come into our village. However, he doesn't look leprous at all. So somehow he's cured, even though uh, that proposition isn't articulated here in the text. The fact that they went out to see him, meaning that there was no fear. He couldn't go to them, so they come to him. And they, and that's a good question. They are risking the fact, well, if Jesus cures and he's in the state of leprosy, if, if we touch him, do we become leprous? Well, technically speaking, yes. But that's not what's happening here. They, for, for some reason, look at the text, but stayed out in the country and people came to him from every quarter. So even though they knew about Jesus touching the man, they still went out to meet him. Now, the question is a very interesting question. If he cured people by touching them, would they be also contaminated? That's a very interesting question. The fact that Jesus does not seek uh, kosher cleansing whatsoever. 
uh, he doesn't submit to the right of purification by a priest. He doesn't do that. And yet people come out and in fact, want to see him. And again, uh, they came from every quarter. So somehow they weren't afraid. Uh, uh, for some reason, they would believe, well, if he can cure the leprous man by the mere touch of his hand, and he, and, and in our Torah law, he is self contaminated, uh, somehow he has power over leprosy. So maybe he's not contaminated at all. His ability to cure the leprous man of himself means that he himself cannot be contaminated. He has, he, he, he has that type of authority. Again, we are simply surmising from the text. Okay, anyone else? It doesn't seem we have any more questions, Father. Okay, well then I will close. Again, my bottom line here for the evening class is that uh, God is in the act of restoration. He, he is in the act of cleansing. He is in the act of wiping away that which inhibits us from coming to himself. He will take on whatever we have in order to come to us to restore us to the fullness of life and health. May this be so this day. God bless you, have a great evening. Yes, thank you for joining everyone. Uh, if you have any further questions, I provided Father Jude's email. It is Ronald Jude at ronaldjudeeli at gmail.com. And for, for, for more information about the Zoom meetings, please visit our website, stdominics.org. Thank you everyone, good night.